Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before God's presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, she is God. It is God that has made us and not we ourselves. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. So enter into God's courts with thanksgiving and enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto God and bless God's holy name for the Lord is good. God's mercy is everlasting and God's truth endures to all generations. Praise ye the Lord. And now we praise God with our hands and voices and we pray that further our Lord taught us to pray. When his disciples asked him, Lord, how do you pray? And he answered, you pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
Today I will be reading from the New International Version of the Bible, the book of Luke, chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me, the door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Thus ends the reading. Of the scripture. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, you who come to us um, and walk with us and talk with us even when we don't know it, we ask you now to come into this worship space, this worship service. Let your spirit um, come down on us. But oh Lord God, help us to move anything out of our own spirits that might block you from getting into us. We need you. We need you every hour. We need you especially now. And so we ask you to hear this prayer and let your presence rule this worship service. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.
you're getting your your vaccinations i hope that you're encouraging your friends and your family to get your vaccinations we're going to keep on saying it because we need to make sure that we take care of ourselves that's just a, a given we have to do that and so in your city uh, in your state wherever it is that you're listening from i hope that you will um, if you haven't already got get your vaccination let's save ourselves protect ourselves amen 
So I'm going to ask you to pray with me for a few minutes on the subject, how long is midnight? How long is midnight? I hope that you're well and holding up, regardless of everything that's going on in your life personally or in this crazy world in which we all live. It's an honor every Sunday to be with you, and I am honored again today. So good morning. and Thank you for listening. You know, it's interesting the questions you can come up with when you're trying to figure out your life. And you will have questions if you are really alive and doing the work. Life is not easy, nor is it supposed to be. Life is filled with circumstances beyond our control, things that catch us off guard and which can help us lose our faith, our hope, our focus, and our vision. If you say, if you say you don't come up with questions about nearly everything that is going on in your life or in the world, I don't think you're being honest. Life begs us to question because life is not predictable. Life gives what it wants to give and takes away what it wants to take away. We don't have that choice. Life is a struggle. You can be up one day and and be completely in, in one of life's dungeons the very next day. You know what I'm talking about. Life goes on with us or without us. And I think life may chuckle sometimes at our lack of understanding of what life is all about and to maximize it for ourselves and for those around us. We just don't get it. And so we live lives of, of quiet desperation and we don't really get out of life all that we we are we are able to get. We just don't get it. So I was reading the scripture that you heard this morning, and I got stuck on the word midnight. Um, I read in the parable that the the parable that you were read to this morning, and I read it, and I've always loved that story. But for some reason, the word midnight stood out. How long is midnight? I want you to pray with me on the subject. How long is midnight? I was reading the scripture that was read to you this morning. Uh, this week. And it's a scripture that I have always loved and always loved. And I read it and I read it and I read it. And I don't know why, but I kept reading it. And then it hit me because I had gotten stuck on the word midnight, midnight. I I, I started wondering how long is midnight? How long do, uh, how many people would say that they are stuck in midnight right now? Uh, midnight seems, when you say midnight, it seems like it's something or a period that lasts for a very, very long time. And it throws people into a state of mind that is surrounded by darkness and, and a sense of hopelessness. But as I read the scripture again and again, and I kept thinking about it, it hit me. Something hit me. Midnight is not a long period of time. Midnight is a minute long. Midnight proper is one minute long. It is the bridge between yesterday and tomorrow. It is the uh, uh, The minute past your past and a minute into your future, it says that 24 hours are behind us and 24 hours are in front of us. 24 hours are gone and 24 hours we have to do something different than we've done already. Uh, It is a marker that says we are leaving the darkness behind us and we are moving toward the light. Um, Midnight is something that is over, says something is over and, and that something is about to begin. It says that you cannot remain in the dark. It says that we cannot remain in the dark. Midnight means we will move forward whether we want to or not. And the quality of our moving forward is really up to us. Midnight is one minute long. Midnight is a time of privilege for those who love us. Nobody is really welcome to bother us at midnight or call us at midnight, except those to whom or with whom we are most close. Those who know that whatever we are doing, whether we are asleep or or partying or reading or, or whatever we're doing, that if that person calls at midnight, we will take the call. We will take the call. We will listen to their voice. Um, those who know us know that that is the case. Everybody won't call us at midnight and won't. So there, there are, there's, there's a, a privileged few, a few who know that they can do that. And we only allow a certain number of people to interrupt our sleep or whatever it is that we're doing at midnight. For the vast number of people that we know, midnight is off limits for them. So this one minute is a very special time. It's a, it's a special and a privileged time. The problem with midnight is not midnight itself. The problem with midnight is that we often cannot or do not take advantage of what midnight, that one minute, allows us to do. We cannot, many of us, let go of the darkness that's behind us or even look for the break of day that is before us. Many of us are engaged in behavior at midnight that is self-destructive and self-sabotaging. 
For many of us, midnight represents the time when we bur burrow into our weaknesses and embrace our demons rather than decide to look away from our demons and decide to step away from them, to take away their power. Midnight allows us or encourages us to uh, operate from under the dark of night, especially at the darkest part of the night, because midnight's darkness hides us. And to be truthfully honest with you, many of us would rather be hidden or hide than to live and risk all that living entails. So though midnight is technically just a minute, we prolong, we prolong our midnights by our refusal, our fear to look toward the light and walk toward it, no matter how uncomfortable the walk or the light might be. And every single day we get this opportunity, every single day we get this very precious minute called midnight. In 1962, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King preached a sermon called A Knock at Midnight, and it was based on the scripture that you heard earlier. The story is a simple one. Jesus has just taught his disciples to pray the Lord's Prayer. And then after he teaches them, he turns to them. He says, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight. There's that midnight. Again, I got stuck. That midnight, that minute between your past and your future. Jesus says, what if you go to a friend and say to him, friend, Lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. Three times, three times in two sentences, Jesus uses the word friend, which says something about the relationship between the one who is knocking at a door and the one who will answer it. That means that a midnight visit is one of privilege on the part of the one who knocks. The person who knocks is close enough to the one, as I've already said, who must decide uh, to answer the door to knock. What happens? The friend who knows the person who is knocking is irritated. In the scripture, he's irritated. What are you doing? Why are you calling me? Why are you in my house at, at midnight? He's irritated. He is not at a place um, of wanting to get up. You know, it's a good sleep. He might be in room sleep. And here comes this knock, a persistent knock. Because somebody knocks on your door at midnight. They're serious. And here comes this knock. So he's irritated and 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 he's not at a place of, of, of wrestling like his friend is who is outside the door. The one who's inside of the house behind the door is comfortable. He's been through his wrestling places. This is not one of his. This is his friend's. And it's midnight. And this guy is knocking on the door. So he's, he wants to stay asleep. I totally get it. He doesn't want to get it from underneath his blankets. I totally get it. And he answers, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up. I cannot get up and give you anything. And that might have been a troubling answer and made the one outside the door go away, except for the fact that the friend outside the door knows that his friend who is inside is, is okay, that his grumpiness is not a big deal. And the fact that he is even answering verbally is a sign of their close relationship. Do you hear me? Do you feel me? Do you get what I'm trying to say here? Jesus doesn't prolong the story because these, these, these the two pericopes or these series of stories in Luke chapter 11 are all stories about praying. Um, so Jesus doesn't stay on this particular story for a long time, but he gets right to the point And he says, I tell you that even though he will not get he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend at least because of his persistence he will get up and get him what he needs whatever he needs in other words jesus says okay initially he's not going to get up initially he's grumpy initially he's irritated but because this guy outside of his door at midnight is his friend is his friend. Eventually, he will get up and give him whatever he needs, even if he is grumbling about it. The friend outside the door is in need. And the friend inside of the house, though irritated because of the time of day, will in fact get up and help him because they are friends. The friendship between the two antagonists, these two people, is the key. The friend outside of the door knows the friend, knows the friend who is inside, and knows that his friend has what he needs has what he is asking for. Otherwise, if he was in that bad of shape, he wouldn't go to a house where he knew there was nothing for him to receive. He goes to this friend because he is a friend and because he is a friend who, who is able to give him what he is asking for. 
So he doesn't waste time knocking at a door of just anybody. His knock at that time of the night at midnight means that he is intentional, intentional about changing his situation. And he knows he can't ask or depend on or trust just anyone. So he goes to this friend. He is ready for this period uh, of midnight to be over. We don't know what he's been struggling with. We don't know how long it's been. Hungry. Let's just put it, let's just keep it with the bread motif. He's hungry, he's having gas. We don't know he's, how long he's been in a place of need to fulfill his own hunger or to have enough in his own space to give to other people. Um, but he's, he's tired of it. And he wants something to change. So he goes to this friend. He is asking for bread, meaning to me, spiritual nourishment, including faith and hope and love, something that's going to fill up the empty spaces. He is hungry for something specific. He's hungry for himself, but he's also hungry for his friends. So if his friends come, he needs to have something for his own being as well. It's just crazy to believe that he's only asking for uh, bread for his friends. He probably doesn't have any bread himself. There's an emptiness about him that makes him, uh, compels him to go to his friend and ask for this bread. He needs something new in his soul in order to heal and be strong and be able to receive these other people who are going to see him. And he knows that his friend can help him by sharing his one faith and hope and love with him. So there he is. Midnight lasts as long as we remain stuck in the minutes and hours leading up to it. This guy has been stuck, I'm presuming, in a place. And he goes and he knocks on the door. Friend outside knocks on the door of the friend inside. In 19, 1962, Dr. King talked about the state of the country because we have inside and outside situations here in our lives. Then and now, he talked about what was going on in the country at that time. The Vietnam War was going on. Black people, geez, were fighting for civil rights, for voting rights at that time. White people were resisting them as they have always done. Churches that called themselves Christian were seemingly ignoring the great commandment and going after black people who were just fighting for the right of full citizenship. Poverty back then and now was increasing, even as the number of wealthy people was increasing. Drug use in poor black and affluent white communities was increasing. People were fighting for a new America on a large scale, even as they were fighting for newness in their personal lives. People were deciding whether or not they would knock on the door of a friend who could help them or if they would walk away from that door and remain chained to their struggles. The struggle back then, the midnight minute back then was personal and it was political. It was personal and it was public. There was a lot, there were a lot of people who wanted to knock on somebody's door to get help. It's not an easy thing to do to knock on a door. It is not an easy thing to do to go in your midnight and knock on a door, ask for help. Because when you are that desperate, you kind of feel a little lonely, a little tired and hopeless. At, at hopeless, You just feel hopeless. And Dr. King said that sometimes it is hard to knock on a door that will result in change, but that everybody needs to do it. Everybody who calls him or herself a Christian needs to be willing to turn to the one who can turn their morning into dancing to give them answers to questions that seem to have no answers, to give them hope and a place where there seems to be no hope, to give them water in a place where it's so dry that they can hardly breathe. Everyone needs to do that. Everyone needs to, to go and, and have a minute of midnight and decide to make a turn toward change for deliverance and freedom. And everyone who calls him or herself Christian needs to be willing to knock at the door of the Christ until Jesus opens it. We complain a lot of times that, you know, we don't get our prayers answered and, and we don't get our prayers answered truthfully many times at the time that we want them. But but this, this story says that if we knock in our own midnight moment, our own midnight hour, if we knock at the door of the Christ, the Christ will open it. Jesus will open it. So sometimes it's hard to do that because sometimes, especially people with people who are real friends, the intimate knowledge of each other can make the friend inside the house irritated with the friend outside of the house. You know why? Because they have heard our stories over and over and over and over. And at midnight, you come knocking at the door. You've probably done it before because, you know, when you're trying to make a change, you go in and out. You have progress and you get pulled back, progress and you get pulled back. So friends, no friends. This friend inside of the house has probably seen 
seen and heard this friend outside of the house knocking on the door several times. And he is just sick and tired of it. That's a special quality of the searching for deliverance. Um, in, the, in the midnight hour, the friend inside the house can have heard the cries of the one outside of the house for a long time and has probably helped before and is no longer interested and in, in, or believing her, has faith in the fact that the, the guy outside the door really wants to make a change this time. But yet this is his friend. This is his friend. They have been through some times together. They have laughed together and cried together and gotten in trouble together and struggled together and prayed together and walked together. These are friends. They know each other. This is his friend. And the friend who is inside of the house has faith and hope and love and is always praying that the friend outside the door will one day ask for it and really mean it and be able to mean it. I should put it that way. And so the friend answers the door. The friend answers the door. And I just want you to think about that because when we knock on Jesus' door and Jesus might be irritated or impatient, but Jesus will answer the door. This friend in this pericope answers the door. He knows what it's like to struggle. He knows that in struggling, there are highs, the evidence of the reality of hope, and sometimes there are lows. There are times um, in the struggle that you feel really good, uh, but he also knows that in the time of struggle when you're trying to get your life together or the life of your children together or get people in your community together so that they and we can help ourselves beat the political system. Sometimes we get discouraged. This friend inside of the door knows that. Uh, and the friend outside of the door knows it too. But the friend inside of the door is in a different place. He's in a different place. He struggled and he's gotten over some humps. So he knows a little bit about the, the, the power of knocking of his friend knocking on his door at midnight, yet one more time again, one more time. He has been there because all of us who are alive have been there. He knows what it is to be depressed. He knows what it is to be hopeless. He knows what it is to lose faith. He knows it. And he wants his friend who's outside the door knocking to be delivered from that hopelessness and that depression and that discouragement. He knows all of that. Um, in this country, we are fighting the exact same battles we fought in the 60s. Do you not think that God knows all of that? We are fighting the exact same battles for the right to vote. Black and white people are still fighting against poverty. White nationalism and terrorism is still in the midst of all we do. Those on the battlefield are discouraged and, 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 and tired. Just the other day, I read the story where some healthcare workers have gotten discouraged and, and walked out of a hospital where the number of patients with COVID-19 is steadily going up and there is not enough staff to really provide maximum care. And they they are tired. They are tired. Hopelessness, restlessness, despondency. When you're outside that door, that's what you wrestle with. And you can't find it. You can't fix it by yourself. When you're, um, I imagine with those healthcare workers, and they are angry that they have had to be called back onto this battlefield when so, just because so many people were given misinformation or wrong information. They were lied to. That's what happened. And now they're sick and they're dying in, in great numbers. And the people inside of the building have already been to that. And they're looking at these people who some of them, even as they are being getting ready to be intubated, are still saying that COVID-19 is a hoax. And these people are sacrificing their lives and their families and and they're tired. So they walk away. They're not trying to knock on anybody's door. They don't want any help. Sometimes you are so discouraged and so depressed that you refuse to ask for help from God or from anyone else. Um, these people are tired. All of us are tired. Um, but then something kicks in. We are, we are, when we get tired like that, we, we walk away and then we realize as we're walking away that we cannot handle the struggle that is before us. We cannot handle by ourselves the struggle that's sitting with us in our homes, following us home, walking with us, bothering us in the middle of the day. Sometimes we, as we walk away, we realize that where we are is not something we can handle by ourselves. This is something only for God. And so we turn around and we go to the door of the Christ. We go and we knock on Jesus' door. We knock, we knock, we have, we make a decision as we're walking. Are we going to prolong our agony? Are we going to keep feeling bad? Are we going to keep sliding down into an abyss of depression? Are we going to do that? Or 
are we going to give ourselves an opportunity for a new life, for a new way of looking at things? Are we going to do it? And if we decide, and this is in a minute, this is an, a metaphorical spiritual minute, that if we do that in that minute, if we what we decide in that minute can determine the next 24 hours metaphorically or the next how many number of years we're going to spend wrestling with this. We can either go back into the darkness, the, the 24 hours behind us, or we can walk into the 24 hours that are ahead of us. We are, are at our midnight minute, midnight minute. Um, and if we decide to go forward, we go knocking on the door of God because, because just like that guy in Jesus' story, knew that the house, the door, the friend that the, of the, uh, that on whose door he was knocking, he had the bread inside. We know that God has what we need. We don't have to wonder about it. We know that God is great and greatly to be praised. We know that whatever we have, whatever we need, God has it. The story, the, the pericope after this, or the, or the sentences after this says, ask, and you shall receive. Knock and the door shall be open. Oh, look into that. Knock and the door shall be open. Knock and the door. Ask and you shall receive. That's the promise of God. It might not come in the way that you want it or in the time that you want it, but this is the blessed assurance truth that if we knock and seek and ask what we ask for and seek and are knocking for will be given to us. That's, that's a blessed assurance, don't you think? Don't you think? Doesn't that make your heart sing a little bit? You know, the key to this midnight thing is to have a friend to whom you can go who will receive you and help you. Some people don't have a friend on earth like that or people that they could not, on whose door they could not, are not good for them. You got to knock on the right door. Um, but as Christians, we have the one. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus Christos. This is office. We can go to Jesus in time. I know people call Christ. We we're going to go to Christ. No, I want to go to Jesus. I just want to go to Jesus. You know, I just want to go to this one who knows me by name. I want to go to the one who, with whom I have a special relationship. I want to go to the one who looks on my fault and wipes my slate clean. I want to go to the one who loves me, not because of who I am, but uh, uh, not in spite, not because of who I am, but in spite of who I am. I want to go to the one who wakes me up in the morning. I want to go to the one who picks me up when I fall down. I want to go to the one who looks at me and loves me, loves me. Even if mom and dad and brother and sister or husband, or wife, even if they don't, God does. God, I want to go to that door because I know that when I knock on that door, that door will be open and God will receive me no matter where I've been, no matter what I've done, no matter how badly I've disappointed, I can go to that door and knock and be received. That's the truth. Jesus will answer the door. Jesus will answer the door and draw us in. Jesus will give us the hope that we are losing or maybe the hope we have already lost. Jesus will give us enough hope to fuel our faith and make us able, able to receive love and also to give love. The midnight minute lasts for us, not because we, um, because we do not understand the value of that minute and what midnight means. Some of us want to stay in the last 24 hours. But if we come to this place in the midnight minute, the minute of midnight, where we say, I am done. I am done with the struggle. I am done crying the same tears. I am done holding my head down. I am done being angry. I am done holding the grudge. I am done sitting on the sidelines when I could be doing something to help myself, my family, my community. I am done. I am done. When you get to that state of mind in that minute, this minute becomes like a birthing room. It's a birthing room. It births out of us. All of that is in us and gives us a space to do and be what we must do and what we were called to do. So I'm beginning to understand it. Midnight, midnight, midnight. I am beginning that we knock on Jesus' door. But then there's one other aspect of this that I didn't think about until really this morning. Jesus knocks on our door too. 
Sometimes Jesus gets so tired waiting for us to knock on his door. And Jesus can see that we're close. We're close. We're in that midnight minute and we could go either way. And Jesus knows that we have gone the wrong way too many times. And Jesus sometimes comes and knocks on our door. He knocks on our door and wants us to answer. And too many times we refuse to answer the door. We refuse to respect the knock of Jesus. And on this day, I am saying that we need to knock on the door, but we also ought to have ears to hear so, and, and a heart to feel so that when Jesus knocks on our door, we consider it a privilege. We consider it a sign of how much Jesus knows us and loves us and wants the best for us. My midnight can last 24 hours or my daylight can, can blossom and be, be 24 hours if I knock on Jesus' door and I answer the door of my heart and my spirit that Jesus is knocking on. This nation in spite of calling itself a Christian nation, has been ignoring the, the knock of Jesus for the longest time, for hundreds of years. Um, that's why we're so jacked up. White nationalism is not Christianity. White nationalism is, po is politics spread over with the word of Jesus, like peanut butter and jelly. That's what it is. That's what white nationalism is. But Christianity, the real love of the Christ is, is something that is life changing for the betterment of all people, all people. Jesus has been knocking on the door of people for the longest time, but some people remain to listen. They believe in the rightness of white supremacy. They believe in the, 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 the their belief that we, they are more intelligent than anybody else. So, you know, we can't, we can't get stuck on that. We have to um, ask God to, to help us to understand what we can understand so that we can do the work that will be uh, effective in fighting that white supremacy, that arrogance, and that ignorance that threatens the lives of so many people. This world has been ignoring the, the Christ, the knock by the Christ for generations, but we don't have to stay there. We don't have to stay in that place and continue to ignore hearing the knock. If we decide to hold on to God, no matter the cost, Jesus will open the door for us. And then if we decide to love God with all our hearts and all our minds and all our souls, as the great commandment commands, we will open the door for the Christ. And we will say, here I am, Lord, at your feet, Lord, come to me. I can't do this by myself. So the, the friend inside the door, Jesus Christ, hears us, will hear us when we knock on the door. And if he has been knocking on our door, he will say, glory. Glory, 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 glory. You finally came. You finally came and knocked on the door. But if he is not knocking on your door right now, then you have to be the friend that lets him in when you hear the knock. We have to be a friend of Christ. Christ is the friend to us. We have to be the friend of Jesus. Jesus is our friend. It is a two-way street. There's a song that goes, you know, the people in church used to sing, if you call on Jesus, he will answer prayer. People who sang that song knew what they were talking about. We have another song. We've sung it here at Crazy Faith. I am a friend of, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. That means we have permission. That means that we have the privilege. We are honored. We are amongst those who are allowed to knock on Jesus' door at midnight. My prayer is that we will do it. My prayer is that we we will as a people and as individuals knock on Jesus' door so that we can survive and beat the suffering and the threats of suffering that we are facing today. Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal, whether it is poverty or domestic abuse or drugs or alcohol or trafficking, anything that's going in in our lives. If we can get to that midnight minute where our lives are transformed, where we are so done that we will either go back and decide to stay back or we will make a decision to walk into the the, into the light. God will hear our faintest cry and answer by and by. We will knock on the door of Jesus and Jesus will answer it. And you know what? Then it's on. All things new. Behold, all things will become new because we will have relinquished our desire to stay by ourselves and knock on the door of a friend who will always answer. If we as friends of Jesus knock on his door, he is our best friend. Is our best friend, our best friend will answer it. He will answer the door. I just want us to listen to the song that says, somebody's knocking on your door.
So what says to me is that Jesus is tired of us hurting and suffering. Jesus is not. And we get the help. We get it.
somebody's knocking at your door, my door, that means that Jesus considers us a friend. And he said, I no longer call you servants, but friends. And we should call Jesus friend as well so that we have the understanding that we can knock on each other's doors at midnight, at midnight, that one minute where we have the opportunity to make a decision whether to go backward or to move forward. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, we come to you right now to ask you to hear our prayer, hear our petition to you to help us to be able to love you enough, to trust you enough, to open the door if you are knocking on our doors, or for us to have enough faith in you for us to go to your door, Lord God, and knock and knock um, so that you will answer. God, help us, help us, help us in our relationship with you. Make us understand that it's not just fluff, that this relationship with you, the fact that you call us friend and that we can call you friend is life-giving and life transforming. Come by here. Come to the homes. Come to the hearts of the people who are in a place who need to hear from you. Come to the door of this country, God. Knock on its door and make some people a bold enough and faithful enough to open the door, to trust you enough that your truth and your love and your mercy will, will have dominion over all of those things that are trying to pull so many people down. God, we pray to you. We pray for the mom or the father who's str struggling because uh, they don't make enough money, who are facing homelessness. We pray for the people who have health care and cannot get uh, any health care because they cannot afford it. We pray that in this, the most wealthy nation in the world, hunger will cease and homelessness will diminish. And we pray, God, that we will be so invested in you, that we will knock on your door to get the energy and the hope and the faith that we need to do the work you've called us to do, and that we will answer the door when you knock on us, because sometimes you come to give us exactly what it is we need. God, wrap your arms around us all. Keep us close to you and help us to draw near to you. If we feel like we're going to turn the other way, help us to cherish our midnight minute. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Thank you for joining us. I hope that you have a wonderful week. I hope you get vaccinated. We'll see you next week. Come and bring a friend. God bless. Take care. Thank you for worshiping here with us today, Crazy Faith. As always, we hope that something in sermon or song gave you food for thought or administered to you in some way. Let us know if there are prayer requests so that we can pray for you this week. Our mission here at CFM is providing direct service to marginalized communities and doing justice work in the fight against injustice. We are collecting socks for the homeless and our goal for 2021 is 2,400 pairs of socks. If you wanna help us in this endeavor, you can give us a donation by visiting our sock web store. The link is in the description box or you can email us at crazyfaith2019 at gmail.com to send it to us directly. Thank you in advance for any support. Join us tomorrow, Monday, August 9th, for Bible study at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. We are taking a deep dive into the prophets. We are continuing to study this topic. So please feel free to invite anyone that you think may want to study the Bible in a very fun and engaging way. We hope to see you all tomorrow. If you want to help with our outreach efforts, you can do it through our website or through Venmo or through Cash App. Our Venmo is at crazy faith. Our Cash App is Red Dip. And our website is crazyfaithministries.org. For those not on Facebook who want to see a playback of our service, you can go to our church online platform at crazyfaithministries.online.church. You can also go to our YouTube channel. The link is in the description box below. So thank you all for tuning in today. Have a great week. We hope that you embody our motto and that we have come to worship and we leave to serve. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Bye.